Next on Lectures in History, University of Massachusetts, Boston, Professor Vincent Canato teaches a class about the culture and economics of the 1970s. He talks about the 1973 oil crisis, demographic changes in different regions, and the rise of new types of music such as disco. His class is about an hour and 15 minutes. So today we're going to discuss, we're going to give an overview of America in the 1970s. Remember in the beginning of the semester we talked about how it takes a bit of time for historians to understand uh, what an era is about, maybe 25 years of perspective at least. For a while the 1970s were kind of seen as a bit of a joke of a decade, right? Bell bottoms, disco, bad hair. In recent years, historians have seen the 1970s as actually very important, in some ways more important than the 1960s, which seems to get a lot of the attention. And one of the themes that historians have talked about is calling this era the age of limits. And we'll, we'll get to a little bit about what that means. So we'll talk about that, but we'll also talk about just the question mark. You know, was it really an age of limits? And we will discuss the import of the decade and the influence that it's had, not just on the 1980s, but really down to our time today. Recapping what we had talked about earlier, we see in the 1970s a pretty profound loss of faith in American institutions, driven by Nixon's resignation over Watergate in 1974, the final end of the Vietnam War in 1975. You see the famous iconic photo of the helicopter atop uh, the U.S. Embassy, taking out the last uh, of the Vietnamese, soon-to-be refugees, out of the country. Uh, it, the loss of the war was devastating in many ways uh, for the United States. It, it really showed that one of the world's superpowers had a big Achilles heel, and it had a profound effect on the military, on America at home. The anti-war movement had uh, divided, the, divided the country. The third thing was the church committee hearings, and there was two committee hearings really in Congress that looked into the Central Intelligence Agency. And for the first time, Americans got to see what this covert intelligence agency was doing behind closed doors, especially in terms of assassination attempts against figures. Um, and this was shocking to many Americans, again, adding to the loss of faith that Americans had in their government and in big institutions in general. The 70s are a time of economic troubles. We had talked for much of the semester about this great post-war economic boom, how the economy after World War II really expands, grows, the middle class grows. Uh, not everyone gets taken up in this uh, expansion, but large numbers of people do. And that really comes to an end around 1969-70. There is a short recession, that sort of year plus. Then there's the big recession around the oil crisis in 1973-75, and another big recession at the end of the 70s, from 1979 to 1982. And the word that defines the economic uh, troubles of this decade was stagflation. Inflation mixed with a stagnant slowly growing, if not growing at all, economy, and rising unemployment rates. You see inflation here, by 1974, it hit 11%. It dips down in the 1977, 1978, but by 1979, picks back up again. Uh, the inflation in the United States economy begins in the late 1960s. Uh, the economic pressures of the Vietnam War, coupled with the Great Society, uh, put pressures on the U.S. economy. And once a country experiences inflation, it can be very devastating. It's not just devastating economically, but another example of kind of losing faith in the institutions. In this case, losing faith in the value of the dollar, something very fundamental. Very high inflation erodes the, the, the value of the dollar and, it, and erodes faith in the dollar. The mid-70s recession uh, coincides with the great oil crisis when OPEC, the, great, the, organizing, the, oil, uh, the organizing nations, uh, mostly in the Middle East but also including Venezuela, Nigeria, uh, puts an oil embargo on the United States for the U.S. support of Israel in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. So this is sort of retaliation for the U.S. siding with Israel. 
The U.S., we haven't talked a lot about the Middle East, but um, it's at this time when the U.S. really comes in uh, on the side of Israel in terms of the Middle East conflicts there. Uh, the oil crisis is going to limit the amount of oil we have. It's also going to boost the overall price of oil. Gas lines are seen all across the country. There'll be another uh, oil crisis at the end of the 1970s as well. I mean, I can still remember, uh, you know, my father going, having to get up very early in the morning to go to the gas station to get the car filled up. This is when we start to see also a decline of oil production in the U.S., domestic oil production. Uh, this concern, are we, you know, how dependent are we on foreign oil that a foreign country can close the spigot on oil and severely damage our economy. Uh, we have this, this is the start of the energy conservation movement. Maybe we need to sort of conserve or cut back on, uh, on our use of energy. Now, this is the, the time period when you get the 55 mile an hour speed limit. The idea that we need to conserve, this, that's all about conserving energy. The other issue, the economic issue of the 1970s, is economic deregulation. The idea that the economy needed to, in certain sectors of the economy, needed to be opened up. The government regulation needed to be lifted. We tend to think of that with Reagan in the 1980s, but the reality is it actually begins in the 1970s, uh, under Carter, but also with Congress. It was clear that during this economically troubled time that somehow Congress needed to, needed to sort of lift some regulations to sort of boost the economy. The airlines are one of the biggest places where we see the effects of deregulation. It was one of the most highly regulated industries in the country. Uh, banking, trucking, uh, and many other smaller industries as well saw economic deregulation beginning in the 70s and going into the 1980s. I have signed Tom Wolfe's essay on the me decade. We read Tom Wolfe's book, uh, the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And this essay is kind of a continuation of the same theme. And that's the theme of this, uh, what he calls in this essay from the 1970s, uh, the Third Great Awakening. But it's Great Awakenings, we talked about a religious fervor. And from the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, he's talking a lot about kind of this idea of the merry pranksters engaging in a form of religious experience. Uh, not in a traditional Judeo-Christian sense, uh, but in a very experimental, different sense. Uh, and Wolf continues talking about that here by talking about the 1970s as the decade of me, the decade of rampant, uh, almost narcissistic individualism. Let's talk about me, one of the lines from there. And this is a quote from the me decade. Uh, but once the dreary little bastards started getting money in the 1940s, they did an astonishing thing. They took their money and ran. They did something only aristocrats and intellectuals and artists were supposed to do. They discovered and started doting on me. They've created the greatest age of individualism in American history. All rules are broken. This, um, this focus on the individual and individual self-fulfillment is central to uh, what begins in the late 1960s and continues on into the 1970s. Wolf begins the essay by by discussing a kind of a um, sort of a daytime talk show, or what would soon be seen on daytime talk shows, uh, with an individual talking uh, to the public about their hemorrhoids, right? Something very personal and private, all of a sudden gets expressed and discussed uh, in 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 the open in public. Why? Because I want to talk about me. I want to talk about my problems, my needs, uh, and. To this day, people often refer to the 70s as the me decade. Uh, there's uh, another famous book, which is by Christopher Lash, called The Culture of Narcissism, which was a more, uh, more academic look uh, at the similar theme. Now, historians have also kind of qualified that as well, because there was also a lot of political activism uh, and you know, community-based activism during this time. But we definitely see changes in society. A greater casualness, uh, jeans, polyester suits. Thankfully, we don't really have those so much anymore, pointy collars, wide ties. But a kind of opening up of society, uh, a society that had been very buttoned down prior to the 1960s. Drug use increases in society. Marijuana increasingly not just is seen in San Francisco or New York, uh, 
uh, but throughout America, and especially becomes a rite of passage for teenagers. The number of people supporting the legalization of marijuana doubles during this time. Uh, by the middle of the decade, cocaine becomes uh, a popular drug, especially among uh, kind of more affluent Americans. There are also legal drugs like Valium. The idea of self-fulfillment and introspection goes mainstream. A uh, famous book was called, of the time, says, Looking Out for Number One, How to Be Your Best Friend. And then in 1970, a man named Phil Donahue uh, introduces, he's out in Chicago, he introduces a new type of national TV talk show where one gets on and confesses one's private sins, shares one's feelings with viewers, and this had many imitators, uh, Oprah, Jerry Springer, all different kinds, Maury Povich, flip on your, uh, your daytime television, uh, even to this day, and that kind of opening up of people talking about all kinds of private things, but now in a public audience, uh, is a child of the 1970s. Transcendental meditation, uh, yoga becomes popular. More Americans are looking to the East, to Eastern religions, uh, and the rise of New Age. Remember, the counterculture was putting itself in opposition to mainstream American culture, and here, in this sense, they're looking not at traditional Judeo-Christian religious values, but looking to the East. The, uh, this idea, this sort of self-fulfillment that, uh, that becomes an emphasis in the 70s leads to an emphasis on fitness, health, uh, from hippie to yuppie. Right? The yuppies of, will, will be uh, sort of the classic caricature of 1980s young urban professionals. Here we've got a picture of two of the most famous uh, TV stars in the 1970s, Farrah Fawcett and Lee Majors. Lee Majors was the was $6 million man. And Farrah Fawcett, most, uh, many young boys had posters of Farrah Fawcett in their rooms in the 1970s. Uh, Charlie's Angels. Jogging. Uh, jogging is, the jogger is to the 70s what the anti-war protester is of the 60s. Now Americans were increasingly uh, taking up fitness and health uh, and taking to the roads and jogging. Uh, seeing uh, people on the road running uh, would now become a much more common sight. Coming out of the counterculture, we see the rise of natural food movements, which now has become totally mainstreamed as you go into supermarkets and see rows of organic foods. This comes out of this period and comes out of the counterculture, looking for ways to improve one's health. You see the popularity of racquetball, which I think has kind of declined. I remember playing when I was younger, playing racquetball. I don't think it's popular anymore, but this becomes a big, uh, a big sport in the 70s and the early 80s. And then bodybuilding and, and weightlifting, and symbolized by the documentary Pumping Iron. Has anyone ever seen Pumping Iron? With Arnold Schwarzenegger as the star of Pumping Iron. This really made him into, into a star. And there's increasing understanding in the 1970s of the harm of smoking. It's when the Surgeon General announces that smoking is actually dangerous. Smoking ads are banned on television. So as part of this move towards self-fulfillment, self-improvement, looking inward, is a move to, uh, to improve one's health and fitness overall. The sexual revolution... You could argue when that begins, but in the 70s is when we see the sexual revolution really flourishing and moving out into mainstream American society. So much of what the 70s is is taking those trends from the 60s uh, and moving that into mainstream America. Uh, the Joy of Sex becomes a uh, national bestseller. Their polls show loosening attitudes towards premarital sex, even extramarital sex. Uh, pornography. This is the era when pornography, again, there was, there's been pornography for as long as, as man has existed, but uh, pornography uh, in terms of movies. So when Times Square in New York, uh, be, many of the movie theaters get turned over uh, to show, show uh, porn movies. Deep Throat is the classic uh, American porn movie of the early 70s, 1972. We have clubs in New York like Plato's Retreat, uh, sex clubs. Wife swapping becomes uh, more common. There is a very famous incident in baseball history in the early 1970s. Two pitchers from the New York Yankees 
uh, I think it's in spring training, decided that they were going to swap wives. They were just going to, you know, one pitcher was going to take the wife of the other, and, they were, and the families were going to switch. And one of the couples ended up staying together. The other one didn't. But this was a huge scandal in the early 1970s. It was shocking. Uh, but still, something that nothing, there was no punishment for the players. So I think one of them was traded within the year. There's also changes in divorce laws. Uh, divorce, again, something that there had been divorced. People got divorced uh, before the 1960s. But you see changes in law, especially with the uh, beginnings of no-fault divorce, which made it much easier for couples to get divorced. They would not have to claim uh, some sort of fault, why someone cheated on them or so forth, or spousal abuse. It could just simply be incompatibility. And you see a rise in divorces in America in the 1970s. American family life will become more fractured uh, from the 70s onward. Gay rights also really comes into uh, bloom in the 1970s. Uh, Most historians date the rise of the gay rights movement to the riots at Stonewall Inn in New York City in 1969. The next year is really, I think, the first, you have a picture here, the first Gay Liberation Day parade. It's in New York City. Uh, There's also a pride parade, I think, in Los Angeles. Uh, Importantly, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association takes homosexuality off of its list of mental disorders. So prior to that, it had been seen as as a, a psychological problem. Uh, states begin to get rid of their sodomy laws that are on the books, not all of them, but some of them. Harvey Milk in San Francisco uh, is elected in 1977 to the Board of Supervisors. San Francisco becomes a, a hub of, of, gay, of the gay community in the Castro District. The rainbow flag, which we see today, is created in 1978. Also as part of, the, part of this is the, the rise of the culture of disco. Um, discos, in terms of clubs... Uh, parties around dance music begins in the gay community in the uh, the late 60s, early 1970s, and really begins to flourish by the mid-1970s. Studio 54 in New York is probably the quintessential, most famous of discos, but there are discos all over, and there's a style of music which becomes incredibly popular in the early, mid-1970s, probably made most famous and most mainstream by Saturday Night Fever. Uh, dance music, mirrored walls, flashing lights, people in outrageous outfits, uh, a lot of people using drugs. This is a, a classic example of, of personal liberation, right? Freedom from restraint, going and, and letting go on the dance floor. The, the music itself was a blend, and, and the culture of disco was a blend of African-American culture coming out of kind of, um, you know, rhythm and, uh, not rhythm and blues, but coming out of uh, kind of black dance music, Donna Summers, um, the most f- famous or infamous of the uh, of the acts was um, the Village People, right? Which um, are around. I think they're even still around to this day. Uh, there's also the backlash against disco, and when we when we meet next class, I'll show you a clip from the most infamous uh, backlash against disco, which happened in Chicago at a Chicago White Sox game. Uh, the disco sucks becomes a, a motto for other Americans, and uh, there are some underlying cultural tensions there in terms of how, you know, are you a disco fan or are you a rock fan? That's going to tell us uh, about, often about your background and, and your ideas. The 1970s is also when we see feminism and the women's movement uh, making strides and coming out. The, you could argue that the early 70s is probably the height, the high point of the women's movement. In the 1960s, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, uh, is really is, is, uh, marked down as one of the most important turning points. She called, this is a book about women Women at Home, it's very much a kind of a book of the 50s, late 50s and early 60s. Um, And it's about wives and mothers at home who feel some kind of, something's missing in their life. She termed it the problem that has no name. And women read the book and would often read the book in sort of, in groups, in reading groups, and, and recognize those problems in their lives. And you begin to get more political action by the late 1960s. The National Organization for Women now is created. You have two sort of kinds of 
women's rights movement and feminist movement. One is a much more middle class movement of a political movement like now. Uh, it's focused on pol the political system. It's work focused on things like workplace equality and anti-discrimination, focused on issues like maternity leave and child care. Uh, there's also another kind of more radical group, women's liberation, which takes a, a much more radical view uh, of, po again, of politics and of, um, of the relationship between the sexes. We see more women moving into the workforce. In 1960, only about a third of women were in the workforce. Twenty years later, at the end of the 70s, uh, more than half were working. One of the Another famous book of the time, which is still in print today, is Our Bodies, Ourselves, comes out of Boston, comes out of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. I think it was a professor at Emerson uh, who started this with a focus on women's health and sexuality. It starts off as just a little pamphlet, a little booklet, and is incredibly popular that by 1973 they're actually publishing it as a book, as almost a mass market book, and is now in, I don't know what uh, edition it's in today. So we're seeing that in the 1970s, we're seeing these movements of, of kind of liberation, of rights, uh, filtering, filtering down and filtering out. In terms of women's rights, the big political issue of the 70s was the Equal Rights Amendment. The amendment was fairly simple. It was to be an amendment to the Constitution called for equality of rights, that equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. It passes Congress overwhelmingly. A number of states, over more than two dozen states, ratify it. It looks like it's going to go and easily become an amendment until political opposition gets formed. And the woman who's credited for that is the woman at the top, Phyllis Schlafly, who leads the Stop ERA movement. This uh, Stop ERA movement is tied to the, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the lecture, tied to the growing uh, conservative uh, sort of conservative-leaning political and social movement in the country that will really that will be culminate in Reagan's election in 1980. Uh, Schlafly and her allies frame the uh, opposition to ERA around much more traditional gender roles and argue that this amendment will threaten those roles. And the op her opposition and her organiz organizing will prevent the necessary two-thirds of states from ratifying the amendment. Uh, there was a time limit in which the states had to approve, ratify the, the amendment. They don't meet the deadline. Congress extends the deadline to 1982, and it never gets passed. Um, on the bottom is the pro-ERA forces, and in the middle is one of the leaders, uh, the woman with the hat, is named Bella Abzug, who is a congressman from, uh, a liberal congressman from New York City, famous for her hats uh, and famous for her political activism. Uh, so this shows us as well not only the strengths of the women's movement, but also the limits and the opposition uh, that are going on here, which will foreshadow future political trends in the coming years. One of the more famous incidents uh, regarding the women's movement, not necessarily the most important, but sort of symbolic, did anyone see the movie Battle of the Sexes with Emma Stone and Steve Carell? I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Bobby Riggs, the man on the left, was a 55-year-old former tennis star. He'd actually been a tennis star in the 40s. Um, and he thinks that there's just too many differences between men and women, and no way a woman could beat a man on the tennis court. Uh, he also liked to gamble. There's, there's the element of money in this as well. He, he, he says, oh, let's, let's uh, he challenges a number of women tennis players to a match. He challenges 29-year-old Billie Jean King to a televised match, $100,000 to the winner. Uh, there are, I think, estimates about 90 million people worldwide watch this match. Uh, King easily defeats Riggs in three straight sets. Now, one could argue that Riggs is over the hill, not in great shape. Uh, there have been some arguments recently that he, um, he, also, he liked to gamble, that he kind of threw the, he threw the match. I'm not sure that that's proven as well. However, this is seen as a victory uh, of, for women over men, and especially Riggs, who is obnoxious, vocal in his chauvinism, uh, the term chauvinist pig, uh, was popular in the 70s, and Riggs came to kind of I'd be identified with that. Do we have questions? Anyone, again, feel free to, to raise your hand at all during this. We're going through a lot. This is a, we're trying to sort of cover a lot of ground here, but 
feel free to, to raise your hand if you have questions. Yes, Austin. I just had a question about the 1982 ERA. Right. See, when I had that section actually in America in the 70s, yeah. and when it was extended to 82, did the bill totally die, or was it ever passed in any... No, this is, uh, this is to get the requisite states to ratify it. Okay. So, so once the bill, uh, the amendment is passed by Congress, then it has to go to the individual states to ratify it. Two-thirds have to ratify it for it to become part of the Constitution. So there was a time limit am among which the states needed to, the requisite states needed to adopt it. And in 82 was the final limit, the, the, the number of states, whatever, two-thirds, I don't know, 30 states or something. Mm -hmm. And it never, it never was amended. Never, no, never added to the Constitution. It's the most, it's the most proposed amendment in the history. Like, people just keep proposing yeah. varied I, ones. It's the most proposed in the history. Of the yeah, I, I think states have, so, uh, since then, some states have voted on it, but I don't think it, I don't think it qualifies as, um, for, for, I don't think they can restart. They'd have to go through the process all over again, I, I'm fairly sure. Another interesting part of the 1970s is uh, an increasing emphasis on ethnic identity, racial identity, family roots. Today we call this multiculturalism. It wasn't called that then. But uh, increasing emphasis on differences. For the decades prior to the, the 1970s, right, assimilation was seen as an important social value, uh, especially if you're looking at the children and grandchildren of uh, European immigrants, the notion of putting aside one's past, putting aside the immigrant past, becoming Americans was important. Now in the 1970s, uh, you're seeing uh, a sort of a resurgence of ethnic identity among these groups. If you looked at TV or movies prior to the 1970s, not a lot of uh, sort of uh, certainly not a lot of racial differences, but not a lot of ethnic differences either. And now in the 70s, you, you see more and more of this. The Godfather is seen as one of the classics, right? This is a, a classic of, well, of Italian-American literature, Mario Puzo. And it comes to the, to the screen and becomes not only one of the greatest movies of all time, but really comes into American culture where you have Americans uh, identifying with a mobster, right? An Italian mobster. He becomes the hero of the story in, in many ways. And this is sort of an overly identified uh, ethnic. This is heavily ethnic. Uh, other movies as well um, at the time. This is also the era of Roots. Alex Haley's book, Roots, about finding his uh, ancestors, his African ancestors who had come over as slaves. Uh, and it becomes, the book is published in 76, becomes a t uh, one of the most popular miniseries of all time the following year. And it sort of turbo boosts the, uh, the prominence of genealogy, the importance of genealogy, tracing your family's roots. Has anyone ever seen those Ancestry.com ads, you know, taking the DNA test? Has anyone ever done one of those tests? You have? They're uh, they becoming very popular. Ancestry.com is popular. Um, genealogy is booming, uh, both for whites and for blacks and for other ethnic groups as well. Prior to, prior to this time, Genealogy was for um, the descendants of the, the pilgrims, the, those who had come over on the Mayflower. Uh, it was used as a way, it was very popular in the 19th and early 20th century. You wanted to sort of prove, oh, you know, I had ancestors who came over in 1630 or 1640. Uh, so native, old, you know, old stock Protestant native-born groups were, were those groups who were doing genealogies and set up organizations like the New England Historical Genealogy Society and Back Bay. Now in 1970s, it's become mainstream and populist. All kinds of groups now want to, to know, you know, what was, what was grandpa's life over in the old country? Uh, where are my African ancestors? What part of Africa are they from? What experiences did they have? There's a great interest in family background as a way of kind of promoting pride in one's own heritage and differences, right? Differences between various racial and ethnic groups become uh, celebrated in that sense. Do historians contribute the rise of the ethnic identity to the breakdown of religious identities, or was there emphasis prior to that? That's, that's a very good question. The issue of, is there a link between the breakdown of religious identity and increase in racial identities? Um, that's, I'm, not so, I'm not quite sure. Um, this certainly is a time in the 70s where you start to see declining 
uh, we talked, we'll talk about evangelical Christianity is going up, but many mainline Protestant religions and Catholic church uh, attendance is going down at this time. So it could be a sort of a substitute for that uh, because people's, I mean, here in, you know, just down the road in Dorchester, the identity of, of most Dorchester residents up until the 60s or 70s was rooted around what church they were from. These are mostly Irish Catholics. Uh, as church attendance declines, I think the Irish part of the Irish Catholic takes prominence and the Catholic part goes down a little bit. Uh, yeah, that, that, that might be. That's a good question. Another important trend is the rise of the Sun Belt. And if you look at the map of America, the Sun Belt is roughly, there's no strict definition, but if you see you know, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Arizona, California, maybe today including Las Vegas, in that area of the south and the southwest. And you can see from this map trends, population trends, of people moving away from what becomes, if this is the Sun Belt, what do we call the, the green part up there, the dark green part? The Rust Belt, or the Snow Belt. Yeah, the Rust Belt. And that implies the, why the Rust Belt is better than the Snow Belt is it implies right, the deindustrialization, the factories closing down, uh, getting rusted, and people now, jobs are starting to open up in the South and the West. Because of air conditioning and the prominence of air conditioning, it now becomes a much uh, pleasanter prospect to live in South Florida or Arizona or Las Vegas or parts of Texas. And uh, down to this day, we see the population growth in America really highlighted in those areas. Uh, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama and Mississippi. Are, it's interesting to see the states that are kind of left out, Alabama and Mississippi and New Mexico. Those are generally states that, that don't, aren't hugely prosperous or growing, uh, but all around it. What's driving the growth in the Sun Belt? Does anyone know what, what's driving the growth? Um, is some of it based off of the uh, movement of industry out of the Rust Belt and into the south? Some of it. Um, s some of that's moving down to the south. For instance, the Carolinas get a lot of the, the textile manufacturing. Uh, that's part of it. What else? Prices in like New York or Boston or Chicago were like very expensive, and you could get like things cheaper, goods cheaper in Texas or in Florida than you could in like New York City. Yeah, housing prices would be cheaper, taxes are cheaper. So, I mean, one reason people move to Florida is because uh, they don't, there's no state income tax down there. Um, weather's better, right? Who else is moving down to the especially Florida? Matt? Yeah, retiree, retirees, older people are, are flocking down to Florida. Um, if you look at Florida, often uh, the two coasts, it's often said that the east coast of Florida is populated by those coming from you know, New England, New York, and then the west side is very much more Midwestern, people coming from the Midwest down to the west coast. You have retirees down there. What else do you have a lot of in the south and the west? You have lots of military bases took a look at military bases in America, most of them are in the south and the west today, and the ones that are in the north, especially the ones around us, closing down. Uh, think about, even though this is not a, uh, a great time, well, think about oil, right, oil production, uh, the oil industry in places like Texas, Southern California, aerospace. So jobs, especially a lot of the sort of big even factory jobs are in these places, and they're attracting people who are leaving places like New York and Illinois. And this is a trend that's continued to this day. Politically, the, the, the top three states are California, Texas, and Florida. States like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, or Massachusetts, every 10 years lose congressional seats because population is moving down to the south. It's not that, I mean, I think our state's population has kind of stayed roughly the same, maybe grown a little bit, but the, the population growth is so much bigger in the Sun Belt. Uh, there's so many more people uh, moving down there, and will continue to move down there. If you look at the big cities, you know, the biggest cities in America today, uh, three of them are in Texas, Los Angeles, uh, Phoenix. So this is a trend, I think, that will continue uh, as people continue to move out of the Northeast and the Midwest, 
the, the deindustrialization of the Midwest continues. High taxes in the Northeast uh, continue to push people out of, uh, of the Northeast. Another interesting and somewhat odd trend in America at this time is the, the renewed kind of Southern culture, especially white Southern culture in the 70s. And it's interesting because if you think about the 50s and 60s and you think about uh, American, uh, you know, the American politics, American news, society, uh, when it looked at the 60s, uh, when it looked in the South during the 50s and 60s, it was mostly looking at the civil rights movement and, uh, and especially kind of the white opposition to civil rights that we saw in the 50s and early 1960s, uh, especially as television begins to focus more on the civil rights movement in Birmingham, uh, you started to see kind of an ugly side of America on television every day and what, uh, how whites were treating African Americans, highlighting the, the Jim Crow laws in the South. As legal Jim Crow uh, ends in the 1960s, though, uh, we get this kind of renewed interest in the South and kind of Southern influences uh, begin to seep into American society, something that we also see to this day. Uh, Southern rock becomes popular. Leonard's, the band Leonard Skinnerd, the song Sweet Home Alabama, which is kind of a, um, it's an answer to Neil Young's song Southern Man, which is this very critical song about white Southerners and their opposition to civil rights. Leonard Skinnerd is, uh, is, is the answer to that. The Southern, Southern man doesn't need Neil Young around anymore. Um, sort of praising Alabama, praising George Wallace. Uh, other bands like Allman Brothers, Marshall Tucker Band. Uh, you also had kind of country rock. You know, the Eagles are not really a Southern band, but there's a lot of kind of rock music that becomes kind of countrified a little bit. Country music, which had been around a long time, uh, was known in the 50s as hillbilly music. Right now, hits mainstream. Uh, part of it is that the old outlaw culture, and I think that's one reason. If, uh, if you're going to explain why this interest in the South and this popularity in this kind of Southern culture, I, I think it has something to do with that individualism, that idea of the outlaw culture. Uh, you know, Smokey and the Bandit, Dukes of Hazard, and these are these are kind of rebels, right? And now rebels in the South have a very specific meaning in terms of the Confederacy and the Civil War, but in the seventies. Rebel has a different terminology, right? Rebel, rebelling against the system. Uh, and there's, so there's an appeal to that. Outlaw country music, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Merle Haggard, and then more mainstream figures, people like Dolly Parton, Emily, Emily, Emily Lou Harris, uh, to where today country music is, uh, is all over. Uh, it's popular not just in the South. It's popular in the North. It's popular everywhere. Uh, it's not my cup of tea, but it's, um, I'm always amazed at the number of people who live in the North who, um, who are country music fans. And you start to see that in the 70s. Race car driving, NASCAR, which is deep roots in the South, going back to Prohibition. Uh, today, again, hugely popular, not my cup of tea, not what I spend my time on. But you see NASCAR fans not just in the South, but you see NASCAR fans all over uh, in New Hampshire, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a kind of an influence of the South. And movies, as I mentioned, probably one of the, the, the big American movie stars of the 1970s is Burt Reynolds, a former fo college football player from Florida. Uh, Smokey and the Bandit is uh, the other, I think it's the CB culture. Anyone, anyone remember CBs? You know, this was a, how this got, I have, a, I have like a board game from the 70s, like a CB board game, you know, a form of, it was a radio communication between truckers. You know, 10-4, good buddy. Uh, so Smokey and the Bandit helped to popularize that. Uh, and here you have Burt Reynolds as the kind of rebel, you know, fighting against Jackie Gleason, the, 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 the cop. And then the Dukes of Hazard, which premieres first in 1979. You see the Confederate flag in the background. The car is called the General Lee. Uh, one of the more popular shows of the late 70s, early 1980s. These sort of good old boys. Um, now being mainstreamed in American society, uh, now no longer meaning the you know racial oppression or Jim Crow, but representing kind of a much broader rebellion against authority figures. And I think that's how this 
um, this seeping into American culture of the South. And the South has always influenced American culture and always had a very important place, especially if you look at our literature. People like Faulkner, um, Flannery O'Connor uh, had, had great influence in American letters. But here we're talking about pop culture. And now po Americans are really kind of absorbing, beginning to absorb this, uh, this very, very uh, specific Southern culture. As we look to civil rights, we saw sort of upswings in terms of women's rights and gay rights, but civil rights uh, is a little bit of a different story in the 1970s. I'll also put this PowerPoint up on Blackboard, so, so have no fear. After the Civil Rights Act of 64, after the Voting Rights Act of 65, the question is what comes next? And the Supreme Court uh, begins to take up uh, hearings on certain issues, many of them having to do with schools. One that does not have to do with schools has to do with employment. And the Griggs v. Duke Power case deals with what kind of tests can an employer give to uh, potential employees. Um, intelligence testing. What kind of requirements can they make? Can they require a high school degree? And the plaintiffs had argued that the Duke Power Company were using, I think they were using the high school degree requirement, that that was, that was adversely impacting African-American applicants because African-Americans had, uh, had lower rates of high school graduation. So, and the court argued that any kind of test or requirement for a job had to be essential, irreplaceable, and directly related to a job. If there was disparate impact, if some requirement impacted the races differently, that could be seen as discriminatory. So now you see we're getting into much more complicated territory here. We're not getting, we're, we're beyond the issue of segregation on city buses or segregated pools or libraries. We're getting into complicated issues about how employers hire. Uh, and this is a case where there was no... Uh, no evidence of outright discrimination, but that the use of these tests could be seen as discriminatory if they impacted applicants uh, differently. The issue of schools also, uh, the Supreme Court is going to take up these issues. In Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, 1971, the Supreme Court says busing to achieve desegregation is constitutional. You can bus students uh, across the district in order to uh, desegre fully desegregate the school system. That will be important in a couple of minutes when we go up and talk about Boston. Uh, the Keys case, Keys v. Denver, looks at northern cities. F for the most part, I mean, Charlotte is, is in, in the south, but Denver is in the west and did not have Jim, Jim Crow laws. They did not have de jure segregation, but they were arguing that the schools in Denver were de facto segregated. They were segregated based on, race, on, on residential patterns. And the Supreme Court said that a city couldn't say, oh, we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have specifically black and white schools, so therefore uh, we can't come on, we don't, you know, you, we can't be under a desegregation order. But the Supreme Court said yes. In fact, de facto segregation could come under uh, a court order, which is what we'll see in Boston. But then in 1974, the court puts a limit on this and puts a limit on busing in Milliken v. Bradley. So here we have a case, Detroit, of a northern city, a northern city that uh, in the 60s and 70s experiences a white flight out of the city, uh, becomes majority African-American. The schools are heavily African-American. Um, and the whites that are in Detroit schools tend to be in mostly white schools. So the solution was... Let's bus children across the city line. Let's, let's bus African-American children in Detroit across the line to the suburbs and white children from the suburbs into the city. This kind of metropolitan desegregation order would link the suburban schools with the urban schools as a way to, um, as a way to balance the schools racially. And it's here the Supreme Court says no. That you cannot do, you can't, you, you can't do that. These are separate school districts, um, and a court cannot order. Because remember, schooling is always done at the, 
I should say public schooling, K through 12 is at the local level, locally controlled. They're run by local boards of education. And the court here <laughs> says, no, we're not going to destroy that. We're not going to create a metropolitan, a huge, one huge metropolitan school district. And that's going to put a limit on what courts can demand in terms of busing. That will have an impact here in Boston as well. The other case dealing with African Americans and civil rights is the Bakey decision of 1978. Alan Bakey was a white applicant to a University of California Medical School at Davis. Uh, he was rejected. He claimed that uh, minority applicants with lower scores were admitted. It goes to the Supreme Court. This deals with affirmative action. And the Supreme Court, in, in one of the, its most convoluted decisions, uh, and I won't even get into the details, but basically it was four people voting one way, four people voting the other way, and then Justice Powell was the kind of the lone decision that was able to garner five votes. And in there, Bakey was allowed to enter medical school, but the court said that, one, that schools could use race as a quote-unquote plus factor in looking at applicants. However, the rationale for that was not compensatory for past discrimination. It was to benefit the diversity of the student body. And this is something that the court has continued to use as a criteria for, um, for using race in terms of school applications, right? This is a way schools, for educational purposes, need to have a diverse student. It's good to have a diverse student body. So in that case, you can look, you can use race as one factor. We're in the middle now, just uh, across the Charles River. We're in the case now where Harvard is in court, uh, being challenged by Asian American students that they do use, they are using race, uh, but not as a plus factor in terms of Asian Americans. And this has kind of opened up the, uh, the Harvard admissions process. But this is tricky. We're now getting into, if we're moving from earlier civil rights movement, think about the Civil Rights Act, which barred the use of race um, you know, in terms of discri job discrimination, hiring, schools. We're now getting into race-conscious remedies, like busing, uh, like affirmative action. And it's here, A, where the legal issue becomes much trickier in terms of what kind of, uh, how much can government use race as a factor? Can racial quotas in jobs, can one say that uh, for a company needs to have X percentage of African Americans or minorities? Uh, do we do that? The other problem is, of course, political, which is that once we get to these, uh, the issues of affirmative action and busing, we get greater and greater political opposition, uh, not just from the South, but also in the North as well. And in Boston is one of the most famous examples uh, of the 1970s of the controversy over school busing to achieve racial desegregation. Here we've got a photo of school buses rolling into South Boston uh, with African-American school children coming over from Roxbury. The quick background on the case, uh, the Racial Imbalance Act of 1965 was a state law which said that any school that had more than 50% minorities was deemed in, out of balance, imbalanced, uh, and therefore uh, needed to be desegregated. Uh, there was one problem with the law. Uh, if a school was 100% white, that was not out of balance. So what that meant was the only schools that that were in violation of this law were Boston schools and I think some couple schools in Springfield and Worcester. Uh, it was only geared towards city schools. Uh, and as we get into the 70s with Milliken, remember the Supreme Court says you can't bus across uh, city lines. It has to be within the city. Now, Boston has the METCO program, which comes up during this time as well, which is a voluntary program in which uh, African-American children in um, in Boston are bused to suburban schools. Suburban schools agree to accept a certain number of METCO students every year, but that is a voluntary uh, student busing plan. The NAACP is fighting uh, the Boston School Committee throughout the late 60s, early 70s, arguing that Boston city schools are segregated, um, especially in Roxbury, parts of Dorchester, Mattapan, uh, those, those areas become gradually more African-American. 
fewer whites live in those neighborhoods. Whites are living in places like East Boston, South Boston, Hyde Park. The NAACP is arguing that the Boston School Committee is, -jigger, is jiggering around with the uh, neighborhood school district lines in order to, um, to keep schools majority white. Uh, they're playing around with feeder schools, what, school, what elementary schools feed into middle schools in order to achieve, uh, to sort of keep as many white students in majority white schools. And finally, in 1974, Morgan v. Hennigan, um, in a uh, federal court uh, uh, case, Judge Arthur Garrity uh, orders, uh, de uh, declares that the Boston schools are segregated and orders busing to desegregate Boston schools. He basically takes control over Boston school, the Boston schools, um, and begins to redraw district lines, decides who will be bused where. One of the problems, there are a couple of problems. One is that because white flight had been happening in the 60s and early 70s, there were fewer and fewer white students to bus. Uh, another problem is, with the most famous problem with Garrity's plan was that he paired South Boston, uh, predominantly Irish Catholic, with Roxbury, predominantly African American, and bused these bus groups, uh, students, uh, into these two schools. And this created a lot of tensions, uh, especially in South Boston, as white, uh, white residents of South Boston bitterly opposed the busing decision. Uh, South Boston, some of you know, uh, sort of a, uh, a very close-knit, tight, somewhat parochial community, uh, proud of its community, proud of its heritage, did not want to be told uh, that they had to either accept black students or that whites, their, that their own students had to go over to Roxbury. Uh, there is, as you see, the police escort, um, very, very high tensions. And there's a growing feeling as well that white Bostonians, especially working class Bostonians, ask why are they made to, to bear the brunt of integration of schools when mostly white suburban schools are completely exempt from this. And it was seen that it was the white working class that was carrying the burden for this, which only increased uh, their anger and their opposition to it. You have here uh, the group created in Boston to oppose opposition. Uh, Busing, restore our alienated rights, roar. You see the lion there on the school box, stop force busing. Uh, and on the right is uh, probably the most famous photo to come out of this, one of the most famous photos from recent Boston history. Uh, the title has, has been called The Soiling of Old Glory. Uh, the man on the right is Ted Landsmark, who is uh, today a prominent architect involved in civic affairs in Boston. The man on the right is Steve Rakes. He, um, the... If you look at the photo, it looks like Rakes is taking the flag and is about to spear Landsman, and the man on the right is holding Landsman so that he could spear him. Uh, this was certainly, uh, Lan Landsmark was being attacked here, but actually uh, the, the picture doesn't quite tell the whole story. The man on the right is trying to hold up Landsmark because he had tripped and was trying to kind of hold him up. But this this really, in one picture, you see the divide, the racial divide between um, white Bostonians, working class Bostonians, and African Americans, and the anger that it created. Uh, the Boston schools will be under the judges' control until the 1980s, early, I think 1983 is when Garrity turns back control over the schools. Uh, you know, Garrity is involved in a lot of very um, small decisions in schools. Uh, one of the more famous ones dealt with South Boston, where he's deciding how many uh, balls the gym and the high school should order. But more importantly, he's there just looking at teachers, uh, what teachers are being hired, pushing for more minority teachers to be hired in these schools. And busing will continue in Boston until just a few years ago, uh, when, bu when, when officially busing uh, in Boston was ended. Was homeschooling an option then? I don't know. Um, uh, not like it is today. I, I don't know what the law was, whether you could keep a child home in the 1970s. That I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. The options were, though, and many white parents did this, either A, parochial schools, send your kids to Catholic schools. There were a lot of Catholic schools in the Boston area. That, that became an, uh, such a big option that the Archbishop of Boston, Medeiros, uh, had to declare that, no, um, that Boston Catholic schools would accept no transfer students anymore. If you were starting at kindergarten, that's okay, but you couldn't transfer from like fifth grade in to escape busing. 
But the other thing is, is a lot of white students just left Boston and moved to the suburbs, moved to the South Shore, uh, or moved elsewhere in the Boston, greater Boston area. Did this kind of larger implementation of like race conscious kind of action, did that have an effect on the resurgence of, I mean, not, not directly, and I don't think that a lot of people would say that it was, but um, did it have some of an, of an effect on the resurgence of interest in the Confederacy? Yeah, you know, perhaps in some ways th- there was. Um, but remember, the number of people who were affected by busing was pretty small, you know, even in Boston. I mean, I mean, just in general, like the, the implementation of affirmative action programs and yeah. things Yeah, yeah, you know, the more interest, yes, I, I think that probably is part of it. Um, but I don't think it's specific, I don't think it's like a, a, a direct relationship. It's more like a broad cultural. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the the anti-busing movement, uh, there's a historian who's written a very good book about it, uh, is how much the anti-busing groups use uh, civil rights tactics uh, to oppose busing. They use sit-ins and protests. Uh, there's a great photo of an of a anti-busing protester with a, uh, with a peace medallion. Right. In many ways, the, kind of the anti-authority movements, right? This this broader feeling of anti-authority is is c- goes down into the busing decision because you know who are you, judge, you know, higher authorities to, to come into our community and tell us uh, where my kid should go to school? Right? We're not listening to you. That idea that loss of faith in institutions and authority is going to impact this as well. And broadly speaking, this kind of Southern culture, this outlaw culture, this rebel culture, sure, that's going to appeal to people as well. I mean, did South Boston residents become NASCAR fans? I I don't know. I don't think there's sort of a direct thing like that. But it's sort of in the culture. It's in the air. It's, it's, It's a... Yeah. I had one question. Was it intentional that the affluent communities were left out? Did they make like a conscious choice, like Wellesley and Brookline, like they weren't going to have to be bust? It was going to well, be South Boston. Well, know? they could. They they weren't going to. The Supreme Court said you couldn't force them to, into busing. They had Metco on a very small scale. The original law in 1965 exempted them because it did not. It only looked at, sco- at, at schools that were 50 percent or more minority. It did not say a school that was 99 percent white was out of balance. And in that way, all the suburban, you know, most suburban legislators voted for the Racial Imbalance Act. They supported it. I think had it impacted suburbs, they would probably would not have voted for it. Right? It would affect, uh, it would affect them. Um, uh, so I was kind of curious about the uh, effect of, uh, I actually looked it up when we were on the Southern Culture slide. Um, so I was looking at a Southern Poverty Law Center graph showing uh, the uh, enacting of Confederate monuments, statues, things like that. And it, while it, like, it wasn't abnormally high at all in the 70s, it's pretty normal. The 60s, in comparison, because of the civil rights movement, is like five times as high. Yeah. So, I, I yeah. mean, it makes, it, that does make sense, the reaction to... Right. Like, in, in the, the s- earliest one was like the foundation of the NAACP is like the highest amount In of, the South. Confederate monuments yes. um, in the South, yes. yes. As a way, it, it, putting up Confederate monuments is a way of expressing your... Uh, support for Jim Crow and your opposition to desegregation in the South at that time. Yeah. Let's move to New York, go down a little bit, because 1970 is another sort of crucial event in, in 70s history is the fiscal crisis of New York. Um, basically, I'll, I'll tell a complicated story as quickly as I can. The New York City almost went bankrupt in 1975. America's largest city, its financial capital, Wall Street, uh, could not pay its bills and, uh, and came that close to going to bankruptcy. Why? Historians argue about this often. A combination of the impact of the economic recessions, 69, 70, and then 73, 75, really hit New York. New York loses a couple of hundred thousand jobs during this time. Um, At the same time, going back to the 60s, which had been a good time economically, New York institutes a, a city income tax. So New York has lots of revenue coming in in the 60s, but they also increase... Um, they increase city programs. There's greater demand for, for city programs, uh, greater demand for uh, welfare. Uh, New York City has its own hospitals. Hospital costs are going up during this time. Um, New York is becoming slightly poorer. Again, white flight. Put, you have white middle class 
upper middle class residents leaving the city, uh, leaves that, that impacts negatively the tax base. People who remain tend to be slightly poorer, greater demand for social services. So what the city does in the early 1970s, it had done this in the early 60s, then resumed it again in the early 70s, a lot of borrowing. Now, it's normal. We're here at UMass Boston. You know, how do you think these, many of these build, new buildings got built? Borrowing. Bonds. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but the city borrowed a lot, and a lot of its bonds were short-term. And during this time, interest rates are going up. And what ends up happening in 1975 is the banks just are not confident enough in New York City for a variety of reasons to lend them any more money. And they say, we're just not going to lend you any more money. And by the way, these notes are due at the end of the month. What happens is New York State, uh, for all intents and purposes, takes over uh, the fiscal control of the city. They create the Emergency Financial Control Board uh, to take over the city budgeting. They also create another organization called MAC, which sells bonds. Uh, and MAC was a state-created organization, so they were able to, to, um, to, to raise money that way. The city couldn't raise money, but MAC raised money. What this leads to is what has been called the era of austerity, tight budgets, right? New York City had to significantly cut, cut its budget. Now, having said that, city budgets since the mid-60s had gone up very dramatically. City hire, uh, hiring of city workers had gone up very dramatically. Uh, there, and there are going to be cuts after 1975 in city workers, police, fire, all down the road. Uh, and you're going to see that impacted in daily life in New York. Uh, I mean, parks already had been in bad shape, places like Central Park. Uh, they get worse after the fiscal crisis when there just isn't money to upkeep the parks. The city will continue to hemorrhage residents. There will be a net loss of a million residents during the 1970s. And more importantly for New York City, there is a, um, it, the culture of New York, the social welfare culture, um, which had, going back to the 1930s, created a kind of urban safety net, free, uh, free city college. Uh, The city had its own hospitals. Support for that's going to increase in this era of austerity. The idea was that the city spends too much money. Uh, The famous headline, Ford to City Drop Dead, that daily news headline, when New York had turned to President Ford for money, initially Ford said, no, we're not going to lend you any money. You got into this uh, on your own. We're not going to lend you any money. Hence, Uh, the headline. As it turns out, a few weeks later, Ford would release some funds for New York City afterwards. There are bigger problems in New York as well. In 1977, there is a, 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 in the summer of 77, a blackout. Uh, Massive looting in neighborhoods, especially poor neighborhoods in New York. Uh, This is, has anyone seen the movie or read the book, The Bronx is Burning? Uh, This deals with, in October of 77, during the World Series, uh, the Yankees are pl- the Dodgers are playing the Yankees in the Bronx, and outside of the, the stadium, there are fires going. Uh, the Bronx had seen, dating back to the late 60s, much of, the, especially the South Bronx, uh, was affected by arson. You see kind of rows of burned out, abandoned buildings in the Bronx. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter goes to Charlotte Street in the Bronx to survey kind of the urban damage here. Uh, It became kind of de rigueur for politicians to go here uh, to see a sign of urban decay. Reagan will go in 1980. On the right is Mayor Abe Beam. Uh, On the positive note, that area where uh, where Carter is now looks very different today. Uh, Small single-family homes, very nice area. This was kind of rebuilt in the 1980s and early 1990s. Crime... In New York, but also nationwide, uh, it becomes a very serious issue. Uh, in New York, uh, the infamous Son of Sam killings in 1976 into 77. This is David Berkowitz, who is the Son of Sam killer. Killed six people, wounded seven others. They were mostly, he, he attacked mostly young couples. Uh, this is what makes serial killers tick. This is a question that we, we ask ourselves today. Uh, in Berkowitz, I think it was a classic case of a man who... who um, was frustrated, did, did not do well with women, uh, harbored, this, harbored hatred of women. The satanic cult, the dog. Uh, yeah, there is a, you know, there is a side story about a satanic cult with a dog and these messages. 
Uh, some people have argued that, that there were other people involved in the shootings besides Berkowitz, some of these cult members. But I think the, the story is he acted alone and was kind of a disturbed individual. He lived in Yonkers. His, um, his killings were all in New York City. Crime itself in New York dramatically uh, increases. Looking at murder rates helps to tell the story, um, although if we pulled robbery rates or car, you know, car theft rates, they're going to be the same. 1960, 482 murders. 1970, 1,100 murders. By 1980, 1,800 murders on a city that's much smaller, that's about 10 or 15% smaller than it had been 20 years earlier. The, the murder rate will go as high as 2,100 a year in 1990. Uh, today, to give you a sense, murders in New York are in the, the, the 300s, and it's a much bigger city. Uh, the, cl- the decline in crime rates, will, uh, you'll, we'll see that in Boston as well, most big cities. Uh, but this period from the early 1960s down to the early 1990s is a period of pretty steady uh, rates, especially in urban areas of, of urban crime. And we see two of the famous movies of the, year, of the period. Uh, the one on the bottom left was Death Wish, which just got remade with Bruce Willis. But the original with Charles Bronson takes place in New York. A man's family was murdered. And as you see, you might not be able to read that. It says, vigilante, city style, judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, The idea he's taking the law into his own hands to deal with criminals. And then more famously is uh, Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, 1976, with Robert De Niro's Travis Bickle, who is, um, again, a kind of a disturbed loner, uh, but more complicated. He tries to save Jodie Foster, who is a a young prostitute. Uh, He's it's filmed on location in New York uh, in 1975 in the summer. So these, these films that are, are, are filmed in New York, you can feel what's going on in New York. You can feel the tension and the problems. Uh, and when you watch uh, Taxi Driver, you can really sense that. You can see the, the, the dirty streets. You can see the graffiti. And you can see how the city is sort of pushing this man, who already probably isn't stable to begin with, pushing him uh, to the edge. But at the same time that all this is happening, if you look at New York, there's stuff going on under as well. Uh, one thing that's happening is the creation of hip-hop music and culture, which is occurring in the Bronx in the 1970s. At the same time, you have um, arson, high crime rates, uh, People like DJ Cool Herc, Africa Mombata, and others uh, are creating the style of music uh, in big block parties in the Bronx. And it's not until the 1980s that it will sort of seep into, uh, seep into the, uh, the, the broader culture. Graffiti becomes part of that as well. One of the complaints about New York and other big cities in the 70s and 80s was the graffiti on everywhere, on subways, on buildings, on bridges. And uh, part beginning in the, the, the 90s, was New York City made a great um, uh, effort to clean up the graffiti, to clean up the city. But you see here, the, we now know sort of graffiti artists, uh, and, and there's a, a greater understanding of graffiti art, and it's linked to hip-hop culture. The other thing that's going on in New York is down uh, lower Manhattan at a club called CBGB's, uh, which, and where bands, Talking Heads, Blondie, Television, the Ramones are playing uh, in this club, which will kind of usher in the era of sort of punk, new wave, college alternative, whatever, in the 1970s. So all these cultural things are going on underneath that were not readily apparent at the time, but we can see today. Going back, broadly speaking, we also see, as we talked about with ERA, the rise of a conservative movement in, in, in America. Uh, often started with William F. Buckley, the creation of National Review in 1955. Buckley is on the left. This journal dedicated to conservative thought, to pushing the, uh, to sort of opposing New Deal liberalism. Barry Goldwater in 1964 runs against LBJ, loses in a landslide, but he runs as a kind of ideological libertarian conservative against government programs. He's a hawk, uh, many things. He's also opposed to the civil rights law, um, and that's a complicated story in, in many ways. Um, but Goldwater, in 64, it was seen that his loss pretty much put an end to the conservative movement. But the events of the late 60s going into the 70s will provide more fodder for the Republican Party. Kevin Phillips, 
1969, writes a book called The Emerging Republican Majority, where he looks at the Sun Belt, looks at the White South, looks at um, blue-collar whites in the North, and says, this, these will be part of a future Republican majority. And it turns out to be right. Uh, often, uh, Nixon's silent majority speech, which we had talked about, uh, was part of that. In addition, this distrust of institutions, this anti-authority feeling, this greater emphasis on individualism will help fuel political conservatism, ironically, because of its criticisms of government, of big government. Right? Reagan will come into office in 1981, and he'll say in his inaugural that the problem is, uh, is government. Government is the problem. This kind of belief that, uh, that government isn't effective, doesn't do the job well, is fueled in part by this distrust of institutions that we see coming in from the 1970s. We talked a little last time that the, the, what's, what else is driving the conservatism of the 70s into the 80s. Prop 13 in the politics of taxes. The rise of the moral majority, the increasing number of evangelical Protestants. As mainline churches decline, evangelical Protestantism is on the rise. Roe v. Wade in 1973, we'll talk more about that on Thursday, uh, puts abortion, turns abortion into a political issue. Um, Northern white ethnic Democrats begin to support Republicans like Nixon. They, be, they don't necessarily leave the Democratic Party, but they are more likely to vote for Republican candidates. They'll be known in the 80s as Reagan Democrats. And then in foreign policy-wise, uh, and we'll talk more about this in coming classes, they is a, uh, a backlash against detente with, with the USSR and a belief that the U.S. needs to rebuild its military and re-challenge the Soviet Union. Uh, and some former Democrats uh, who are hawkish on foreign policy will move to the Republican Party. These are called neoconservatives. So we see in the 70s the end of the New Deal coalition the birth of the Reagan coalition with traditional Republican voters, farmers, but in addition, evangelical Protestants, northern white ethnics, and southern whites. Uh, in 1964, when he signs the Civil Rights Act, Lyndon Johnson was alleged to have said, although I'm a little dubious about whether he did, that uh, upon signing it, he handed over the South to the Republican Party. Uh, the, the Democrats, uh, the South had been solidly Democrat uh, going back to the Civil War. It's more complicated than that. Going down to the late 70s and early 80s, a, a big majority of congressional Southerners were still Democrats. But as we see over time, over the decades, down to today, the South is, there are some exceptions today, um, had become increasingly Republican. At the same time, the Democratic Party is changing. Uh, there is a new Democratic majority, some people argue. A de-emphasis, let's forget about the old labor unions and the bosses. Let's forget about the political machines. Focusing on minorities, African Americans, as well as college-educated white liberals. Uh, the Watergate babies are the congressmen and women elected in 1974 in reaction to Watergate. They are, almost, they are the new-style politicians. They are liberal, uh, upper-middle class, college-educated. It's a different constituency than the old Democratic Party. And then finally, in conclusion, what does it mean? What does the age of limits mean? It's the end of post-war optimism. Right, it's the political fragmentation and polarization in our politics, the weakening of the American military, the deindustrialization that we see in the economy, the beginnings of economic inequality and insecurity, and the possibility of limited natural resources that we saw with the oil crisis. Yet, there's an increasing emphasis on personal freedom and rights in the 70s. There's expanding opportunities for minorities and women. There's a kind of cultural flourishing of the, in the 70s, disco, hip-hop, punk, film in the 1970s, a golden era of American film. And we have the picture here, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, uh, in 1976, start Apple computers. There they are working in their garage. Bill Gates in 1975 will start Microsoft. Uh, no limits there, right? These mostly young men who are working in anonymity in the 70s, building, starting, creating the technological revolution that will have great impact uh, down to our time today. So I think the age of limits, we have to sort of put a qualification on there because we're going to see, beginning in the 1980s, vast changes in American society and economics. Thank you very much.
You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.